Welcome to the Customary Land Podcast. I'm your host, Spike Boydell. The Customary Land Podcast is about all things relating to the equitable management of customary land. We discuss tools and ideas needed to manage, use and equitably maximise interests in land at the interface of custom, tradition and development in its many forms. The Customary Land Podcast is for everyone living on, identifying with and wanting to use or access resources in or on customary land. In the last episode, I questioned the appropriateness of a coronation in 2023 and flagged the need for Australia to move towards becoming a republic. Indeed, I spent Coronation Day 2023 not watching or listening or observing the coronation in the news, but rather, in a moment of solidarity, I downloaded Stan Grant's Australia Day uh, on Audible and spent the day listening to that very significant and quite profound piece of work. I wanted to listen to The Queen is Dead by Stan Grant, which came out to more or less coincide with the coronation, but unfortunately it's not yet available on Audible. This episode explores what constitutes the 21st century citizen and how we feel about our political and legal rights and our identity in the move from monarchy to a republic in contemporary Australia. Now I'm going to draw on data collected in a series of focus groups. I make the premise that the removal of a crown creates the opportunity for the recognition of the guardians of this land that goes back significantly beyond the forthcoming referendum on an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in Parliament, something I touched on in the first episode, and noting the journey of Indigenous Australians to be accepted as citizens has been particularly harrowing. Such a contest of ideas might be seen by some as undermining the very fabric of contemporary, that is settler, society, and a possible move from freehold title to leasehold tenure that presents a threat to their interpersonal recognition. So be it. In opening, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the local Aboriginal people, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land in Sydney where this podcast is coming from. Similarly, I'd like to pay respect to the elders both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians for this place. Indigenous Australians have occupied this place for more than 60,000 years, whereas white settlement began a little over 200 years ago. White settlement deemed the land terra nullius, and under colonisation, the various adaptations of English law that came into force in each of the six states and two territories vested the superior interest of the land in the English crown as head of state. But let's put the previous two statements into context and provide some background for this episode. Back in 2007, I was invited by the then director of Jumbuna, the Indigenous House of Learning within the University of Technology, Sydney, to speak at the Indigenous Studies, Indigenous Knowledge, ISIC conference that he was facilitating. As the only non-Indigenous speaker, my presence and my property rights paper on customary land in the Pacific caused something of a stir. Likewise, the statement that Aileen Morton Robinson made in the closing of her ISIC paper stirred me to quote, We own this effing country. Whilst her peroration was met with rapturous applause, I felt that her use of the word own was perhaps misplaced as a Western term that is more reliant on possessive individualism than customary collective guardianship. More on the semantics later, but meanwhile the seeds of a research collaboration that goes to the very root of identity were starting to germinate. 
Imagine, if you will, what might change in terms of our identity as citizens if Australia were to become a republic. Something that many see as inevitable, albeit a situation which is yet to become a reality. Now, I'm not talking here about the tokenism of a new flag, or a contemporary national anthem, or even in the transfer of proxy leadership from a governor general as representative of Charles III of England uh, and the English crown to a president that's representative of the Federation of States and Territories. Rather, my interest lies in what happens to the superior interest in land and the associated subsidiary property rights when, rather than if, Australia becomes a republic and what the ramifications are for no those notions of identity. Perhaps it's my background as a researcher of property rights, an eclectic amalgam of ideas that sits uncomfortably at the nexus of law, economics, sociology, geography, philosophy, political science, and property theory, not to mention archaeology, anthropology, ethics, history, and planning, that keeps drawing me back to muse over this particular question. If we replace the crown, and the crown's superior interest in the land with something, and if that something is an acknowledgement of the guardianship of the land through Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stewardship, would this, could this, or should this affect the underlying way that we as 21st century citizens in Australia relate to real property? This leads into an inherently deeper sociological question that is grounded in our identity, our citizenship, and the respective interplay with how our identity and citizenship are, to some degree, wrapped up in how we understand land, real property, and our real property rights. In an attempt to respond to this question, a few years ago I established a transdisciplinary project that brought together Indigenous lawyers and public intellectuals, a historian, a project manager, a land and property tax specialist, and a property theorist, to muse over these issues. We gave the project the ambiguous title of Sydney Restored and managed to secure internal funding from the University of Technology Sydney under a challenge grant scheme. The timing of the project, inception, was important as the then Howard Liberal government persistently refused to say sorry for the past misdeeds of the state towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, an issue subsequently redressed under the Rudd Labour government's apology to Stolen Generations on the 13th of February 2008. Our early work of the Sydney Restored team focused on visualising our understanding of the project from our respective backgrounds, establishing a blog site, which, despite its somewhat contentious content, never attracted any real attention or traction, and developed a couple of conference papers that were well received. What these early collaborations demonstrated was that within the Indigenous community, the recognition and restoration of property rights that had been lost under the notion of terra nullius was a given. There was nothing to discuss from an Aboriginal perspective, as it was perfectly natural to recognise Indigenous sovereignty in a post Marbo world. Rather, our challenge in the project lay with the identity and preconceptions of the settler citizens who saw their own rights and obligations and restrictions over land and property as sacrosanct. Our politically controversial project envisioned an optimal resolution to the native title discourse and a pointed response to the Howard government's inability to apologise for historic misdeeds. The project identified two core aims. First, a theoretical inquiry into the institutional arrangements necessary to enable an innovative land restitution model for Sydney, 
and therefore, using Sydney as an example, for wider Australia, that vests the superior interest in land and buildings thereon in the stewardship of the customary Indigenous guardians, rather than, as it currently is, under the existing system to the state or the Crown. Second, the solutions oriented project tested a head leasehold outcome for existing holders of freehold or strata title to ensure intergenerational equity of property rights and contrasted this with a land taxation model. Central to this approach, both models analysed how to ensure the continued economic growth of the City of Sydney and thus wider Australia under such a restitution arrangement. We started by taking a property rights approach and then explored a leasehold solution and a restoration rent tax framework. In parallel, using the tool of creative non-fiction, we elaborated on these issues with other scholars. Property rights are, fundamentally, about social relations. Real property rights obligations and restrictions can be found in and change across the full range of human societies, both in time and in space. Property rights research, as I alluded to before, has emerged from a broad range of disciplines. By taking a, a transdisciplinary approach, our research challenged the variable interpretations of real property rights that have evolved particularly in the fields of economics and law. The gulf between economic and legal interpretation is accentuated by the confusion over property rights within the published literature. And this is partly fueled by the differing definitions of real property, the urban planning perspective, and an investigation of a sociological dimension of people, place, and property. Our research inevitably challenged the accepted notion of private real property rights in Sydney, and, as I've said, by inference elsewhere in Australia. We needed a picture of the ways that the things we take for granted have been made. We needed a story of the construction of the basic categories through which land is known in a public sense. The 1973 Federal Commission of Inquiry into Land Tenures demonstrated a good example of this set of circumstances. And I quote, in our modern complex society, an individualistic approach to property rights and land ownership is incompatible with public interest unless individual rights are restricted to the use and enjoyment of the land. Our challenge then became how to understand these notions of identity from the perception of those who may rail against any change in the status quo. In other words, how we might respond to those that see any tenure change or modification as impacting or limiting the enshrining rights or perceptions thereof of the settler community in the business world of Sydney. The research design we used focused on assessing both the scope of current knowledge about property regime options and attitudes to particular changes. To do this, we engaged three focus groups, each comprising several expert participants drawn primarily from the property, legal and planning professions, both public and private sector. The research team identified these groups as representative of the top end of town, so to speak, profession, professionals with expertise in evaluation, management and administration of land and property that could promote a meaningful dialogue on options and variation to tenure and property title under a republic model. Having obtained UTS Human Research Ethics Clearance, the research team secured the services of Eva Cox as the focus group facilitator. Eva's been at the forefront of research design that engages free-flowing focus group dialectic. She's a recognised expert in the field and cognizant with all protocols related to, we hope to eliciting rich 
data from the participants. Drawing on the focus group transcriptions and reflections provided by Eva Cox, the focus groups demonstrated considerable interest in both the content of the research and in having a forum for discussing the multiplicity of issues raised. These included the role of the Crown and its residual powers, the various concepts of leasehold, and the interests involved in the processes, as well as the differences between the capital value of land and valuing of the improvements of development and usage. That's something I've talked upon in other episodes in the series. Current debate on various environmental challenges were a stimulus for the focus group discussions on the possible increased government need in the public interest to intervene in basic private ownership rights. This highlighted an interesting acceptance amongst participants that the need for action on the basis of the common good interests in land was likely to become more prominent and acceptable over time. This has been witnessed by climate and other changes that necessitate a more public intervention over the perceived levels of control held by individual owners. Such recognition was, however, heavily tempered by the widespread recognition that the general public have strong beliefs that their property rights are, or should be, be sacrosanct and in, inalienable, conveniently overlooking the historic inalienability of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities' relationship with the land. Whilst acknowledging different forms of communal tenure that are more commonplace in other European countries and amongst our Pacific Island neighbours, the prevailing perception of the Anglo-colonial legacy in Australia was of the home as castle. Expanding on this, the participants commented that, mo that most people do not understand the limits of their property rights that are detailed in their current titles, let alone any potential for further intervention by the Crown or its agents, this despite the multifarious mineral and exploration licenses that have been granted by the state under most land in Australia, including in and around Sydney. There was a clear assumption underpinning the initial discussions that the role of any tenure process is to allow business to be secure in its investments and to have costs of managing the documentation minimised through simple, efficient and inexpensive titling regimes. Actually, the titling regimes thing has been brought in, certainly here in New South Wales, um, whereas it's all electronic now, there are no paper copies of everything, which is great until there's a hack or there's um, a solar flare or whatever, or a polar reversal that impacts on all those records. But I guess if that happens, we'll have problems in um, all sorts of ways anyway. This suggested the role of government is to set in place regimes that facilitate national and international business transfers. This underlines an illustration of Aristotle's point. Debates about rights are often unavoidably debates about the purpose of social institutions, the goods they allocate and the virtues they honour and reward. So despite the fact that we were, we've had a financial crisis uh, since those, or by the time really, of those focus groups that has discredited market triumphalism in both its laissez-faire and neoliberal versions, there was a strong view from those embedded within the business world of why change a tenure system that isn't broken. Such a response, of course, highlights the importance of how any future proposal for the change to the tenure system associated with the declaration of a republic needs to be presented very carefully. I.e., is there a problem, burning issue, a financial issue, or a question of fixing something that is wrong and offends basic values and equity? Well, obviously, the current circumstance offends the rights and basic equity of 
the traditional custodians of the land. In some ways, the focus group were less concerned by that than upsetting a pre-existing apple cart and a system that works for them. And a bit like I think we saw with the coronation of people uh, getting on board with pomp and ceremony rather than going to the deeper questions at this moment in time in the UK scenario. Back to Australia. Given the makeup of the focus groups, the business needs understandably tended to dominate the discussion, with public needs seen as something of a residual. The focus on market triumphalism suggests that the identification of the wider questions of how and why land is held and used may provide a useful entry point into a public debate on what is meant by title and land use. For a significant preconceptions in society about land and the title attributes of freehold interests and leasehold interests. The majority of the populace don't fully comprehend the notion of ownership. Freehold interest, for example, is, as I've said before, the simple absolute in possession there by grace of the crown and managed for the, and on behalf of the crown by the, the current states and territories. What people own is not the land or property thereon, but rather what they own is a collection of often overlapping and incomplete property rights associated with a particular plot of land or a particular property or building. Likewise, the indigenous assertion proffered by Aileen Morton Robinson that we own this effing place is equally misconstrued, I would argue. To quote from one of my original collaborators on the Sydney Restored Project, Larissa Berent, our affinity with land is like the bonding between parent and child. You have responsibilities and obligations to look after, care and raise a child. You can speak for a child, but you don't own a child. As Larissa's quote illustrates, Land can be thought of beyond the westernised and masculine to represent a number of issues, such as rights, obligations and restrictions. We've heard the free market triumphalism perspective, and the picture is not necessarily any clearer if we introduce the legal interpretation that land is elemental. It's where life begins, and it's where life ends. Land provides the physical substratum for all human activity. It's the essential base of all social and commercial interaction. This legal perspective would indicate that there might be some logic when raising the idea of changing the basic tenure, name and associated rights, obligations and restrictions to move beyond our supplanted Western interpretations of freehold and leasehold. Such an approach is not without precedent, given that the hitherto unrecognised and previously inconceivable property right known as native title was brought under the aegis of Anglo-Australian common law with the 1992 decision in Marbo versus Queensland, Marbo number two. A new word and definition of a superior Aboriginal interest to replace the crown situates both the name and the process change in a bigger future picture, and also questions of heritage and recognition to be raised as part of a collective well-being debate. However, within the focus groups, perhaps understandably, the immediate re reaction to the idea of some form of superior Aboriginal title was initially negative. This was grounded in concerns that it would raise public fears and that Aboriginal ownership of the superior interest would not be seen as acceptable. Such initial reactions were emotive rather than rational, given that the prior discussions within the focus groups had opened the possibilities of some form of strategic tenure recognition. Inherent in notions of identity, such responses were also partly personal and partly based on assumptions by focus group members that the wider public reaction would be more negative 
from their informed, educated understanding. Critically, fears were expressed that linking some form of superior Aboriginal title to the Republic could sink the idea of the Republic. In this regard, the assumption is made that this type of change would have major financial implications, even though Eva Cox did not originally raise the land taxation issue. Indeed, Eva's reflection on this point was that it demonstrated a widespread anxiety-guilt mix in the community that somehow assumes the damage white Australia has done to Indigenous people will drive demands for high financial compensation. When the reality is under the current referendum proposals for a change to the Australian Constitution to provide an Aboriginal voice, lack certainty of acceptance given how politicised the issue was always likely to become. Moreover, our Sydney Restore research identified additional anxieties related to transferring residual rights of a Crown, such as those associated with mineral rights in some title regimes, to Aboriginal guardianship. There was a sense from a focus group that there could be a loss of accountability. Inherent in the concerns were scare tactics raised about the difficulties of transferring, codifying or negating established authorities and systems to an alternative model. On this point, I share the perspective offered by Michael Sandel in the fourth of his 2009 Reefly lectures, and I quote, Market mimicking governance is appealing because it seems to offer a way of making political choices without making hard and controversial moral choices. It seems to be non-judgmental. So, for example, rather than engage in a morally charged debate about the proper way of, say, valuing the environment or about the attitudes towards nature, we should try to cultivate rather than do this. We try to set environmental policy by working from people's market preferences. Well, the same hard and moral choices are to be found in dealing with the biggest dimension of a republic debate the land. So hard of the moral choices that typically the wider debate has hitherto been reduced to the lowest common denominators of the flag, the anthem and the top job. To move the Republic agenda forward, we need to explore a new kind of politics, what Sandor refers to as the politics of the common good. Contemporary market-driven politics sees citizens as consumers with market-mimicking preferences that are given and fixed. If our new 21st century citizens want to live in a brave new Australian republic and fully engage in democratic argument, the whole point of the activity is to critically reflect on our preferences, to question them, to challenge them, to enlarge them, to improve them. Every successful movement of social or political reform has done more than change the law. It's also changed attitudes and dispositions. If Australia is to move forward as a republic, we, the citizenry of that brave new republic, need to change our preferences, attitudes and dispositions about real property rights in a way that enables a local expression of universality and hopefully an expression that recognises the historic and traditional stewardship and custodianship of this land over the last 60,000 years by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I hope you found these ideas interesting and or thought-provoking. In the show notes, you'll find a link to my original A 21st Century Citizen in a Brave New Republic paper and all the sources I draw upon, should you be so interested. If you're watching this, all episodes are also available 
in your favourite podcast player. Or if you're listening via a podcast, there's also a YouTube version if you prefer to watch. As always, I'll close with a disclaimer. The views and insights and opinions shared on the Customary Land podcast are those of a host and any guests, and any others they may cite. They do not constitute legal or financial advice and should not be construed as such by any individual, group or organisation. Before undertaking any dealing or action relating to customary land, individuals, groups or organisations should obtain professional advice from a qualified lawyer, an experienced valuer and or chartered certified accountant with specialist expertise in your particular country. Alternatively, you can contact Customary Land Solutions for advocacy, advisory and capacity building solutions for customary and indigenous landowning groups and trusts on land management, leasehold, valuation and resource compensation issues. You can contact Customary Land Solutions by email using the address contact at customarylandsolutions.com. Alternatively, if this episode has raised any issues that you'd like to discuss, you can email me directly at contact at thecustomarylandpodcast.com. Until the next episode, stay safe, stay well, and thanks for listening.